Hello, hello, hello. Uh, good evening to you. It is about 621, 621, 622, depending on the time. Uh, tonight we're going to begin our Bible study question and answer period just a little bit early. Uh, we will begin promptly at 630, but I wanted to come on early just to have a moment to speak with you, if I could, just kind of from my heart. I didn't know who was free. I know many of you may be getting your notifications. So I'll give you a moment to uh, tune in or to log on. I'm sure many of you have had a long day at work. Uh, for those of you who may be stay-at-home moms and taking care of children, that definitely is a full-time job, and there is no clock out from that. Uh, we pray that you know you find all the peace and strength you can to keep pressing on. And I want to say my hat goes off to every mother that has to be mama and daddy, has to wear a lot of hats. Uh, hat goes off to you. I'm sure it is not an easy task, but one thing we know, God can and God will see you through. Uh, just to introduce myself again, for those that may not know me, my name is Rodney Smith Sr. I pastor New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church, where God has allowed me to stay for over 13 years now. And God has blessed me with so fine and so wonderful a people. I can't think of a better place that I would want to be. And so to everyone that's out there, I want to say good evening to you. Sister Verdi Davis, uh, Sister Sandra Davis, uh, Sister Shawan Abram, one half of the A-Team, to the Davis family as well. Uh, Sister Turney, Turner, excuse me, Kathy Turner, good to see you with us as well. God bless you. Um, I just kind of wanted to, to come on early. We're going to begin with prayer at 630. We have some very good questions as always. But th there was something that took place today uh, that was eye-opening. Uh, it, it disturbed me. It was an indication of how necessary uh, sound biblical teaching is. Before I go any further, I want to give my disclaimer. I am not setting myself up to be the end all of all Bible knowledge. That's that's just not me. So the Tim's bless you. Good to have you. I'm not setting myself up as the pinnacle of all Bible knowledge. Lord knows there's so much that I have space to learn. Uh, I'm appreciative of the questions that are submitted. Uh, I take those seriously. Uh, the questions that have been turned in uh, next week, Sister Tamir Tim, we have a uh, um, we have a something on the agenda. But I was scrolling through the videos on YouTube, like many of us do, and when you hit one video, it kind of opens you up on YouTube to more videos and other videos. And there's this comedian guy, I don't know his name, I can see his face, and he'll make comments on videos on the internet, and it's it's funny, it's lighthearted fun. And there was one that I saw today of a church, small church, looked like a quartet kind of singing. And in the middle of the song, the guy starts doing like a Michael Jackson routine. And when I say a Michael Jackson routine, the moonwalk and kicking the leg up and the, the hip thrust. And initially, I laughed because I'm like, this was an actual real video. This wasn't some made up for fun video. It was a real church, authentic sounding, authentic looking. And I laughed and got a good laugh out of it. And I, it was only a two minute video, just over a minute, minute and a half. And I went back to the beginning and I began to laugh and I stopped. I was like, wait. There's somebody that's singing a gospel song. And it was, a, I, I think I'm familiar with the song. And in the middle of the song, he began to do a Michael Jackson routine. Now, that sounds on its face laughable if it wasn't serious. In and it was under the guise of, I'm full of the Holy Spirit. 
jumping up and down, literal moonwalk, the way Michael Jackson used to hold his hands. We've seen it. We've all watched the Michael Jackson performance video. And that bothered me. And I was like, what is happening in our churches? Uh, apparently, this may have been pre-COVID. I'm not sure. But what, what is happening in our churches to where under the cover of I just couldn't help myself, the Holy Spirit led me, i.e. God led me to moonwalk, to do a Michael Jackson. Inter no. And there's something wrong when the level of spiritual immaturity is combined with a low understanding of scripture and mixed in that pot of gumbo is sensationalism, emotionalism, and entertainment. And when you put that thing in a pressure cooker or an oven and you let it cook, you come out with a Michael Jackson routine and I would be willing to bet there was somebody, despite how on its face, logically, it is, we'll just say unscriptural. But I will be willing to bet there's somebody in that church that said, amen. You can't say God can't lead him to do Michael Jackson. There's something missing. And I use that moment that I experienced with the video just as a launching pad into a more serious and a deep discussion. It's almost 630. But people, let me say this to you. We have, as God's people, we've got to get serious with the Bible. We've got to get serious with understanding Scripture. We've got to get serious with our Bible knowledge. Once again, there's a whole lot I need to learn. My desire on my heart, I want to get in seminary. Because just trucking along and reading books and finding trusted teachers, Lord, that's hard. I want to get in seminary, you know, Sister Karma Gardner, good to, to have you with us, Sister Waller. But so there's a whole lot I have to learn. Please know that. But I remember various times in my life just talking to people and they have a serious Bible question. A question that there's a lot riding on a decision they need to make. It could be a marriage. It could be a job. It could be a lifestyle. What does the Bible say? What does God condone? It's a serious Bible question. And I said this to a younger person once, and I wasn't being condescending. I was being factual. And I said to him, now, I have the answer for you. But just from speaking to you, you have a Ph.D. level situation. A Ph.D. level question but you have only a grammar school level of Bible understanding. So I can give you the answer and I can show you in scripture, but the supporting scripture and understanding to hold the weight of the biblical answer, the framework just isn't there. I can tell you, here's what God's word says. See, Revelation connected with Daniel and Daniel's prophecy is in time. And, and that's called eschatology and, and revelation. And here's how this means and the rapture and the Trinity. And, by, and I can give it to you, but because you have such a minimal biblical foundation, it's only going to lead you to have more questions. You can ask me what's the formula for gravity, but when I give it to you, Here's what gravity is. And I write the formula out. Physics and all these things. You don't know what pi is. You don't know square root. You don't know how to get the answer from the parentheses and long division. You're still doing timetable. So I'm saying all of that, hopefully to encourage someone to, to stir someone's heart up. People, we need the word. I, I, I want to plead with you. This time we have at home where we're not able to get out as much, in some ways, it can be a blessing in this way. Read your Bibles. Find trusted 
teachers that can help you. Hopefully that's at New Hebron. You certainly, I know, can get it at New Hope with Pastor Tim's. You certainly can get it with Pilgrim Valley, uh, Pastor Patrick Green. I mean, uh, oh my goodness, uh, my, my mind is escaping me. If you're able to get on with uh, Pastor Edward, St. John Missionary Pastor, uh, Baptist Church, you certainly can get good teaching there. I, I, I'm only saying this because people, without God's word, we make ourselves an easy target for the charlatans, for the hucksters, and, and, and I'm going a little bit over here, but let me say this. I saw the, many of you have, and I'm just speaking to you from my heart. I saw the Paula White prayer. I, I, I didn't, I, I don't understand it. And that is in no way to be demeaning to her, that ministry. But calling on angel, first of all, who tells you you can call angel? Who? Where in the Bible are we given command over angels? An angel is an angelic messenger. Angels are gods. I mean, there's a list of things in my head, discerning wise. I'm like, look at this, 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 look at this. Look at this. Like, and I'm like, well, how, how are these things prevalent? How are these things front and center? And, and, and so much of it is any person that loves the Lord, if you don't invest in your own personal spiritual growth, the real victim is you. Yes, everyone has to have someone to teach them and to train them. But Paul said this at one point. He said, listen, he spoke to the Corinthians. You should be on meat by now. But you're still on milk. You you should be teaching others. Not that as a teacher you are exempt from being taught. But you should be mature enough to where you've learned enough. You can deposit in other people. But yet you still need people to deposit in you to teach you. And everyone just, we're about to pray. As your own spiritual goal. Well, goal is not the word. Your own spiritual assessment. Not your friend, not your family, not me, not anyone else, not the person in the room with you. Think back to when you accepted Christ, whatever age that was, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, whatever. Have you grown proportionate to the amount of time you've been saved? Do you, I'm just going to use a blanket block, 10 years of being a Christian, 20 years of being, a, 20 years of being saved. Do you still not know how to find some of the basic books of the Bible? Can you tell somebody else what salvation really is? I'm just thinking of these basic questions. And I'm saying this, let me encourage you. Hopefully tonight we'll go over something that is beneficial. But let me, let me encourage you to invest in your spiritual growth with sound doctrine when you find something that contradicts what you've been believing and how you've been living, don't just eat it, swallow it up front. Research it. Double check. If it's something that I say or any teacher, any preacher, any leader, get some scripture from it. Read that. Re research it for yourself. Are we supposed to be doing this? Because I haven't been doing that. You just taught me I should be doing something and I trust you. I don't think that you're leading me astray intentionally. But before I make a change, let me check on that. I challenge you to show me in the Bible where that is true. If, if you believe X, okay, if you believe that, show me how you come to that belief. Show me where the Bible substantiate this doctrine, this teaching, this lifestyle, or where the Bible denounces this doctrine, this teaching, or this lifestyle. People, these things must be done because every tub sits on its own bottom and we are accountable for our own individual spiritual growth. And so I, I wanted to share that with you. We, we're about five minutes over. Thankful to all of you who came in early uh, and those who you are with me now. Sister Turner, God bless you. Um, we're going to have a word of prayer. But just that that video, it, it just, it bothered me. I laughed. I'm like, whoa, what are you laughing at? I mean, there's a certain comedic aspect. There's a comedian making fun of it. And it's obviously outlandish. 
out of order. But like, this is a church where these things were going on. And I love God. I love his word. I love his people. And I want to see him represented rightly. I want to represent him rightly. And so before we go into these Bible questions, let's pray. And just take a moment with me. We, we, we need prayer. So let's, let's, let's pray together, if you don't mind. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we're so thankful for all the things you've done, for all the doors you've opened all of the blessings that you have given. We thank you, Lord, for the mind to go to school, for the providence of giving us a career, for the patience to deal with children, for the heart to want to serve, even when serving gets difficult, when serving gets hard, when serving requires a sacrifice. We still thank you for a servant's heart. There were times, Lord, no doubt, as we, all of us collectively have served you at one point or another, we contemplated letting go. But we can just hear the words of Jeremiah. It said, I can't quit. That your word was shut up in me like fire in my bones. And so, Father, thank you for that devotion. We owe it to you. You gave it to us. Thank you for the increase of our faith. And even these practical things, a home, a rented house, transportation, a car, a bus pass, food, clothing. But all of these things pale in comparison to the gift you gave us one Friday when Jesus hung on that cow on that rugged cross from the sixth until the ninth hour and he died. Shed his blood as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. He was innocent. He was guiltless. He was the spotless lamb, but yet he died. For our sins. But Lord he didn't stay dead. Three days later Sunday morning he rose. We thank you for the gift of salvation. As we go through these questions tonight. We pray that you will open our hearts. Soften our mind. Open our understanding. Teach us. Lead us. Instruct us. Feed us until we want no more. And we ask you this. In the name of Jesus. And they all typed or they said amen. Sister Gardner thank you too. And a couple questions tonight uh, to the questions and, and to those that are hearing. Um, it's my prayer that anything that we hear, it's my desire to substantiate it in scripture. Please know if there's any mistake, all the foolishness and mistakes go to me. All of the credit and glory goes to God. If there's any mistakes, it won't be because of him. It'll be all because of me. And so oftentimes I even pray this prayer. I pray not to be repetitious, but the desire is there. Like, Lord, don't let any foolishness in me mess up what you're trying to do. Please, Lord, because somebody really has a question they want to have answered. And it's a it's a humbling thing. You know, everyone doesn't just automatically come out and say, hey, I got a question. Not by way of Bible study, not too often. So the, the first question is a very, very good question. How do we mix, as I'm working with all my, my paper, my laptop, my coffee, my Bible, my pen, how do we mix faith and common sense? Who Jesus? Sister Bonita Lane Robinson, how do we mix, I'm asking rhetorically, you don't have to answer, but how do we mix faith and common sense? Now, this is a very, Tanya, because this is a very good question. This is a very good question. Um, one that if you're not discerning, biblical discerning, discernment is not, I know the future. D discerning is not, you know the answer to every riddle. Discerning is, with God's help through the Holy Spirit, with God the Holy Spirit, and what you know from Bible, something don't seem right with that. I may not be to put my hand on it, or sometimes I know what the Bible says, that's outright wrong. How do we mix that? How do we have faith in God, trusting God, not knowing the outcome and trusting him? How do we mix that with common sense? 
Let me give you some examples to where when you don't have it, how it can go wrong. Remember Jim Jones? I don't mean the tattooed up gang member rapper with the diamond Jim Jones. I mean Jim Jones, the preacher from the 70s and the 80s. Very charismatic, entertaining preacher. Uh, I believe at one point he was in California. He moved from somewhere in the Midwest, as I tracked his story in the past, to California. And he became so popular that one of our presidents, Jimmy Carter, his sister was a member of the church. That's a pretty substantiating, you know, member. You know, that'd be like if Obama's family member joined New Hebrew. It'd be like, oh, oh, that's serious. But Jim Jones, remember how the people blindly followed him? We're talking having faith in God, trusting God, not knowing the outcome, but still using practical application and common sense. He took him over to Africa. Was it Africa? Another country anyway. And he made what's called Jones Town. Remember that? You, you ever hear the phrase, drink the Kool-Aid? He, he was about to be captured. People holding people hostage, making them work as slaves, you know, made them drink Kool-Aid that was laced with cyanide. 909 people died following behind the wrong person. Uh, not knowing the difference between, you know, faith and common sense, trusting God and using your own natural mind and logic. That can lead some people to not take medicine when they're sick. I don't mean I have a headache. I don't feel like going to the bathroom. I mean, I got cancer and I'm not taking chemo. I mean, I got pneumonia and I'm going to pray this thing down. I mean, I've got the flu. I've got the walking flu and I'm going to speak this flu out of me while you infecting people all around or COVID. You know, I got COVID and, and I'm not claiming COVID, doggone it. I, I'm, I'm going to church. I'm shaking hands. I'm hugging. I'm kissing. I'm doing it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You not only can play with your life, you can play with somebody else's life. Or even something as routine as if you're not able to know the mixture between faith and common sense. You can make yourself one of these members of Creflo Dollar's church to where you rent in the room, but he convinces you to help him buy a brand new private jet and will spiritualize it. Uh, something is wrong with that. Something wrong with that. So how do we mix faith with common sense? Well, how about this? Uh, there's a couple of scriptures I want us to read. I want you to please get your Bibles because I want to make sure you're reading this with me, not just hearing it. So if you have your Bibles, the first one, let's define faith. Hebrew chapter 11, the author of Hebrews is anonymous. We don't know who it is. Some say Paul, some say Luke. God didn't tell us where the Bible is silent. We must be silent. So you, you hear people say the author of Hebrews said, well, we don't know who the human author was. We know divinely it was authored by God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, now faith. We know this verse is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Huh? Now that kind of a misunderstanding of that verse can increase people in saying, turn your brain off and just trust God. And listen, Jim Jones want to go to Africa. Creflo Dollar say he want a $50 million jet. Uh, uh, you know, they say, if I don't have enough, if I have enough faith, I should, I don't have to go to the doctor. I can just talk this COVID. I'm going to speak this COVID out my body. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But be careful. There's another verse. And see, this is Bible study. You have to add scripture with scripture. You see, from that, you can look in Hebrews and you can look in Romans and you can look in Isaiah. And all these build a beautiful tapestry of God's view on something. Because if you just take one verse and snatch it from the surrounding verses and other books of the Bible, you can pretty much make it say what you want it to say. So Hebrews 11 and verse 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen. But Romans chapter 10, verse 17, listen to this now. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing what? And hearing by the word of God. Stay with me. Faith is not a question mark. Stay with me. Faith is not a blind leap in the dark. No, ma'am. Faith is not crossing your fingers and just, ah, uh, that's faith. I'm trying. No, 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 no. That's not faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Faith is strengthened by what the Bible says. Just to, just to bring that out. I don't know how it's going to help my relationship when the person at church is mean to me. I don't know how it can work if I do what God says. He said, bless them that curse you. Love your enemies. Do good to them that spitefully misuse you and abuse you. Lord, I don't see how doing that is going to work, but I trust what you said in your word. I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to obey you and I'm going to do just what you said. I'm going to rely on the veracity, strength, authority of scripture. That's faith. Faith is not, ah, huh? no, 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 no. That's not faith. Faith is not a question mark. Faith is standing on the rock solid proof, rock solid authority of what God's word says. So when it comes to faith, we, we have to know what faith means. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You don't know the outcome. You don't know how obeying God in scripture in this way will work. But guess what? A prerequisite to obedience is not you having to know how things would turn out. If God told you how things would turn out, you wouldn't need faith. It's walking with God. And if I can use the analogy, it's like holding his hand in a fog. If the fog was lifted and you can see a mile down the road, you wouldn't need to hold his hand. But because you can only see so far, you can only know so much. You have to trust God who can see the beginning, middle, and end. He's omniscient everywhere. He's all-knowing, all-powerful. So faith is based on trusting the rock-solid authority of God's word. Well, okay, pastor, how does that mix with common sense? Practical understanding. There's a, a, a fallacy out there. And I want us to turn to Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. If you don't have your Bible, just write this verse down. I, I, I want you to read these for yourself. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. This is God talking. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, crimson, a dark, deep red that's so dark it looks black. Your sins are a stain just like scarlet. They shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool that is white like wool on a lamb. The first part of that verse, I'm sure you have learned, uh, understood by now, is what I want to emphasize. Come now, let us reason together. There's a fallacy. There's a false narrative being taught. The false narrative is that when you become a Christian, you're anti-intellectual. That when you become a Christian, you don't use your mind. That when you become a Christian, you're gullible. You believe anything. You follow anything. You get led by the nose by anyone. All they have to do is say a few scriptures and you'd be like, well, it must be from God. I'm going to Africa with Jonestown. No, no, no. God 
tells us. Let's reason together. Let's think this thing out. Not that thinking things out is the end result of how you're going to figure stuff out. Because there is a cliche. And it's been tossed around and used the wrong way. But there is a certain amount of true theology in it. And that cliche is, why are you trying to figure it out? I can get a few amens, I know. God has already worked it out. Listen, we're not smart enough to navigate through this sinful world and get through it unscathed. We're not smart enough to go head to head with Satan and he can tell me all he wants. I can outwit him. No, you can't. We're not smart enough to deal with the onslaught of trials and suffering and temptation. No. So when he says reason together, that's, that's not what he's meaning. He's saying that when you become a Christian, that don't mean you turn your brain off. So how do we marry the two? How do we bring these two together? We trust what God says. We believe his word in spite of the critics. I'm still going to love my enemies. In spite of the critics, I'm still going to church. In spite of the critics, I'm still going to pray. In spite of the critics, I'm still going to do what's right in an office where everybody is doing what's wrong. In spite of the critics, guess what? I know what his word says. I'm not giving my body away and I'm not married. In spite of being talked about, mocked and laughed, I'm trusting God to do what he commands in his word. And guess what? When I get to church, and I see a preacher with gold rings and a gold car and a helicopter and a Mercedes on Monday and a, 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 a Bentley on Tuesday and an Audi on Thursday. And he say, I need y'all to help me with my car payment. And come on, I need my hundred dollar line. No, 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 man, man, please. You ain't twisting my arm with that nonsense. C come on, man, please. Stop that. I'm, my mind is not cut off. Just because you throw a few scriptures out there do not give you leeway to try to make a fool out of me. No, sir. So yes, we trust the Lord, but don't leave your common sense at the front door. It probably, if a, and I'm going to use this analogy of a pastor. And listen, I don't down pastors. I'm a pastor. Pastors are my favorite preacher. God loved pastors. He loved preachers. He only had one son. He made him a preacher. But I want to use this analogy because I see it too often. If a preacher was at a church in the 80s and he had to leave on the scandal because he messing with the women. He was at a church in the 90s. He had to leave that church on the scandal because he messing with the women. He had a church in the early 2000s. He had to leave that church early because he messing with the women. He had a church from 2010 to 2019. He had to leave that church because he was messing with women under a cloud of scandal. And now he put his resume in at your church. I mean, yeah, pray about it. See what God says. But don't leave your brain at the back door. You wouldn't go to a mechanic that's been messing up cars since the 80s. You wouldn't go to a doctor that's been having malpractice suits since the 80s. So use your brain. He might have a problem, y'all. Or, or he might not be called. He might be a wolf in sheep's clothing. I'm going to cut it off right there for time's sake. I'm only saying that when we become a Christian, Isaiah 1 and 18 lets us know we don't turn our brains off. So if they keep asking you for $1,000 and they ain't paid you back the last 20 years, stop giving them $1,000. If that boy keep calling you at 2 a.m., he want to come in the cover of darkness, but he don't want to take you to McDonald's, stop letting them over your house. If a person keep lying to you and you confide in them and they keep spreading your business, stop telling them your business. Reason. Don't turn your brain off because they throw a few scriptures out here and there. No, ma'am, no, sir. Don't do that to yourself. And what is faith? Faith is I'm trusting in the rock solid proof, the rock solid authority of what God's word says. Now, there's a whole lot we can say about that. I'm not going to belabor the point. Uh, if there's a follow-up question to that, please feel free to send it. I do. It, it, it doesn't hurt my ego if it's incomplete or it didn't quite, uh, as, my, as some of the seniors will say, if it didn't quite scratch where you itch. I, I want to make sure that the question is answered. So that's how we can, in a very common way, mix faith with common sense. You don't turn your brain off. And faith is not a question mark, not a blind leap in the dark. 
Faith is trusting what the Bible says in spite of what the critics say, in spite of what the word says. So that's question number one. Next question, a little bit more straightforward. Well, it is, it, it is to me and maybe it will be to many of you also. Is it wrong, we're going to talk now, to be married to a Jehovah Witness? Let me just say first, the real theme subject in the midst of this. What does it literally mean to be in an intimate, close relationship like a marriage? to someone who does not believe the Bible. Now, let me say this. Or to someone who has a skewed understanding of the Bible. Uh, to any of my Jehovah Witness friends, uh, certainly none of this is to be offensive, but it's not my job to be politically correct, but it is my job to be biblically accurate. The Jehovah Witness is a cult. It is not a religion. It is a cult. At one time, they wouldn't even let black people be Jehovah Witnesses, which, you know, the, the, the thing I want to say before I go further about the main theme, the thing I want to say is the main of many issues, one of personally the main differences between a Christian and a Jehovah Witness, which are, they are not Christian. They do not believe in the worship of Christ. If I could put it in a very practical layman's term, I mean, they would say their vernacular, it'd be dressed up way more than what I'm going to do. But they would say Jesus was a good dude, but we ain't going to worship him. I mean, come on. And don't just say the Lord, you have to say Jehovah. Well, he has many names that, highlight many aspects of his character. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord's my provider. I mean, we could go home, go on. But they do not believe in the worship of Christ. He was a good dude, did some good stuff. But David was a good dude. David did some good stuff. My uncle was a good dude. He did some good stuff. The preacher down the street, a good dude. He did some good stuff. It's kind of in that way. The Jehovah Witnesses, and, and, and I have to you know, make sure I honor God and be honest. It's not a religion. It's not Christianity. It is a cult. And you can just go to Google as a, one guy at my job. He's a bit older. He calls it the Google machine. <laughs> go to the Google machine. What do Jehovah Witness believe? You can see for yourself. Go to their website. They'll show you for themselves. And you read long enough. If you know the Bible, you're going to be like, oh, no, no, no. They may be nice people. But they're just nice people that don't know Jesus or have a skewed understanding of the Bible. As it relates to the worship of Christ and a person who was a Jehovah Witness, I do not have any hesitation now. I used to, but I do not have any hesitation speaking with one. I don't seek it out, but I've had them come to my home a couple of times where I'm at now. And I kind of stop them and tell them, I already know our difference. And they, yeah, you know, they agree with me. We just agree to disagree. I go back to cutting my yard. But in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, and if you have a moment, turn there. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. And this is the narrative. It's Christmas time. Christ being born. Uh, the wise men, the magi from the east, they follow the star. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. I'm just going to read the A portion. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. And guess what they did? Fell down and worshiped him. Now, if he was not deity, if he was not the son of God, this is blasphemy. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him alone shalt thou serve. Jesus said that when he was tempted by Satan. In our Sunday school lesson, the very first of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So if they fall down and they worship just a good dude, just like the 
my uncle is a good dude, and just like the preacher's a good dude, that's called blasphemy. But when they came and found Jesus, they fell down, Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, just the A part of the version, and they worshiped him. The rest of the verse talks about the gifts they gave. We don't know if it was three wise men. There was three gifts, but we, that doesn't mean they were three wise men. It could have been 10. They all pooled together and each they came out with three gifts. We don't know that. So Matthew 2 and 11, they fell down and worshiped him. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Just having Bible study to substantiate who Jesus is. And if you get into an intimate, close relationship, like with somebody that does not recognize the deity of Jesus, there's a problem. Matthew, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9, 10, and 11. And when I begin to read it, many of you are going to be familiar with it if you don't already have your Bibles. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Paul says, wherefore, he's been building a case now, the theology of Christmas. He's talking about who Jesus really is. This is what Christmas is all about. It ain't about lights, Santa Claus, reindeer, Christmas tree, high energy bill, and high credit cards uh, bills that's going to come. Because January is going to hit if, if Christ don't come back. It's about Jesus taking on human flesh, condescending, coming from streets of gold to the dusty streets of Jerusalem. And because he chose to take on human form and take upon him the form of a servant, Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, God has highly exalted him, him being Jesus, and given him a name that's above every name. We're talking authority now. It says that at the name of Jesus, I wish I was in the pulpit right now, every knee should bow of things in heaven, they're going to bow, of things in earth, we're going to bow, of things under the earth, in hell, they're going to bow. Every knee is going to bow. And verse 11, and that every tongue could should confess. Confess what? That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To the Jehovah Witness. To say we don't worship him. He's a good guy. Oh, no, no. He's better than a good guy. <laughs> He's the God man. So as it relates to the specific question, is it wrong for me as a Christian, a man or a woman, to get married to another person who's a Jehovah Witness, or another man or a woman? Is it wrong to get married to them? Well, let's let the Bible speak for itself. I'm only going to read a portion of one verse. And many of you know it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, just the A portion. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. <laughs> Listen to me now. The rest of the chapter, the rest of chapter six is devoted to Paul showing how we are on opposite ends of the extreme. If I love Jesus and I get hooked up with somebody that doesn't love Jesus. If I love Jesus and I get hooked up with somebody that doesn't know Jesus. If I love Jesus and I get hooked up with somebody who has a skewed view of Jesus from the Bible, that's called unequally yoked. And listen, li li listen, 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 listen. That's not just marriage. Please stay with me. That's not just marriage. Who are your friends? Stay with me now. Doesn't mean because you're a Christian and you're growing and maturing that other people are off limits. You can't, I can't speak to you because you don't go to church. I can't speak to you because you don't know where the book of Revelation is. Or you call it Revelations with an S. It doesn't have an S. It's singular. It's one revelation. Just many facets to that revelation. N no. But if you have a close bond, friendship, fellowship, that's your best friend. That's your girlfriend. That's your homeboy. And they don't know Christ. And if... In your interactions, you're not constantly trying to win them to Christ or to lead them to Christ or to show them sound doctrine in some way, shape, form, or fashion. You just, we kicking it. That's my partner. 
I mean, I know she do drugs and run the streets and one, you know, do all kind of stuff, but that's my home girl. Be careful. L listen, that, that would go for friends. That would go for business relationships. Be careful. <laughs> Be careful. And it certainly will go for marriage. Lord have mercy. So if you're asking, is it wrong for a Christian to be married to a Jehovah Witness? That question is best, and, and, and hopefully this gets to the heart of it. That question is best brought out in this way. If I love the Lord and I know what the Bible says about Jesus, should I then embark on a lifelong till death do us part relationship with someone who does not? Answers, of course you shouldn't. No. And, 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 and listen, Jesus said it best. He didn't even say frat brother, sorority sister. He said, let me tell you something. If you love your mother and father more than you love me, then you're not worthy of me. Like our allegiance to Jesus, there's nothing that we should be willing to sacrifice that would hinder our walk with him. Nothing or no one. The, the, since this is on the subject of relationships, and generally, it's, it's women, it, it, it generally, but generally, you just think of a picture of a woman with a dude that don't come to church. And, and let's just be clear, is that not the majority of cases? The church has so many women, it's almost a feminine organization. You scarcely can find a man anywhere. And when you do get some, you, 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 you know, you're so happy to have them, you want to Use them in everything. But uh, let me just say this. To, to any woman that's searching for a prospective mate, I may have said this Sunday, and I heard this in a song, believe it or not. The only thing worse than being single is wishing that you were. You better take your time. Because once you jump that broom, you're going to look back at that broom. If it's with the wrong person, you're going to want to burn that broom and break that broom. I'm telling you right now, and if this individual does not know the Lord, has a skewed doctrine, they come up with all kind of weird, you're like, what in the world are they talking about? And you want to get married to them? Whew. Hold on. I'm going to help myself. You setting yourself up for a life of pain. Lord have mercy. Listen, so hopefully this is helpful. I don't care how good she looks. I don't care how handsome he is. Anybody been married longer than five minutes? Listen, looks fade. I mean, if your only reason for getting married is looks, the, listen, you need something way more substantial than a shallow exterior feature than looks. To, you think looks going to hold you for 20 years? No, ma'am. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. Listen, figure eight might not always be a figure eight. You start having them babies. He, he, he might not always look good in a t-shirt working on his car. Wait till you start taking the high blood pressure medicine. I'm, I'm only using this lighthearted way to let you know beauty fades. But Solomon, with that God-given wisdom, said a woman, could be a man or a woman, but he said a woman that serves the Lord, that loves the Lord, that's what's going to last she deserves to be praised. And so find you a man that love God. You know, find you a man that, 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 you know, or if it's a woman, find you a woman that love God. Lord have mercy. But don't be unequally yoked. Um, finally, I was asked to do a wedding with an individual. And uh, I'm just taking him at his word. He was a Christian. I don't know his individual walk with the Lord, or uh, I'm only saying I don't know what church he went to or how he served or how devoted to Christ he was. I'll say that. I take him at his word. He said he was a Christian and he wanted me to do the wedding for his wife or, or prospective wife. I said, what church she go to? And he said, such a sudden kingdom hall. I said, she's a Jehovah witness. He's like, yeah. I said, well, both of y'all are not Christians. And, and it, it came out so instinctively and it wasn't nasty. It was just like, a matter of fact, not, not to be nasty. And I, and I, I apologize. I said, 
I'm not speaking in any way demeaning of the woman that you love. But if that is the teaching that she subscribes to, that is not Christianity. And by 2 Corinthians chapter 6, y'all would not be unequally, you all would be unequally yoked. And how can I stand in front of God, the church, Christians, and try to bring together what God says shouldn't be together? I, I, I then would be violating what scripture says, along with you and her. I said, so you guys should really sit down and have a Bible talk. So you do you know why you believe what you believe? Does she know why she believes what she believes? And, and I'm closing with this. We can't afford, and, and I tell my son, I tell Kennedy also, you can't sit in a college campus with some liberal, progressive-minded professor who thinks all these strange, strange things and say, that's not right. Well, why is it not right? Because my daddy told me he a preacher. So what do you know about the Bible? Do you know why you believe what you believe? Do you know why baptism is submersion as opposed to sprinkling? Do you know why you don't have to sit in a little booth and pull the cover back and confess your sins to a dude sitting across there? And if I give enough money, he can say, oh, you're forgiven now. As long as that check clear. Do you know why these things are true? Because you can't just say my daddy told me or the preacher told me. I wish Sister Hunter was here. Y'all know what she would say, because you have to know him for yourself. So we'll we'll go ahead and we'll we'll close right there. Sister Brown, God bless you. Sister Verdi Davis, bless you as well. Uh, Sister Brittany Davis, I think I see you on here too. God bless you. Please feel free to to answer, uh, ask, or submit any question. Uh, I'll close yet again. I just said that five times now. I know y'all making all kind of jokes. Yeah, yeah, you you been closing, uh, fella. <laughs> but listen, I'll, I'll close by saying this: these types of Bible studies, these practical questions that many people have, these are necessary. People, these are extremely necessary. We we must address these things because you you never know. You may submit a question, but it's several other people. Maybe they're not logged on now, but they may catch it down the road that may have the same question you have. So please don't feel in any way hesitant to submit a question. There's no question that's too small. <clears throat> there are some that can be too big. Some I got to be like, oh, let me pray hard, Jesus. Let me really get the books out. But uh, we'll go ahead and conclude right now. I'm appreciative to all of you for your time. I certainly want to stress to you again, please make sure you invest in your own spiritual growth. Hopefully this has uh, helped us in some way tonight. Thank you, Sister Gardner, for the kind words. And I want to reiterate again, uh, we had a little situation, minor situation, but um, we, we, we want to ask you to please make sure that your comments that you submit would not in any way be deemed offensive to someone. Uh, if that does happen and it can cause a distraction and we would have to at that time, you know, bar a person from participating if some of the wrong comments become a distraction and have nothing to do with, you know, Bible lesson, prayer or the discussion at hand. So just want to kind of reiterate that again. Uh, we have a good thing going. Let's keep it going. I pray that everyone is safe. Listen, wash your hands, take a bath, wash your clothes, whatever you need to do to stay safe. But most importantly, trust in the Lord. Because at the end of the day, everything is, is, everything is in his hands anyway. So I pray that we'll meet again Sunday morning, Lord willing, at 930 for our Sunday school lesson. And then we'll come at 1045 with our morning message. Hopefully, all of you will still be safe and sound. And we'll go forward and learning some more about the Lord at that time. God bless you, and I pray that God keeps you safe in his own. So until we meet again, we'll talk soon.